The pulpit that was there had a motto that was beautifully painted in gold letters where anybody who stood up behind the pulpit to preach would see these words. Sir, we would see Jesus. And so to prepare for Brother Ron to come and preach to us tonight, let's talk about our Lord Jesus Christ in a hymn number 16, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, Let Angels Prostrate Fall. Hymn number 16, and let's stand to sing all four verses. And I think Brother Ron is also going to sing for us tonight, is that correct? We'll see you at the end of the song. Okay, good. <laughs> let's stand to sing number 16. Please pray. Yes, go right ahead. Brother Ron sang all the way down here. So okay. <laughs> good. Seated. It is a joy and delight to have Brother Ron Vandermeer with us tonight. Uh, he's come all the way from California, and uh, that's a big trip, brother. We are really pleased to have you with us tonight, and so we turn it over to him. Brother, preach the word. father was uh, in this church many times. I don't know if he ever spoke, but uh, shortly before he died, we, uh, my brother, my father and I, when we had a hundred years of combined ministry, we sang uh, the song, and I'm going to just sing, I think I'll just sing the first verse, 520. You can put it in there. 
We didn't record it, but I uh, wish we had. Whoa, that's low. There we go. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he we serve, the sweeter he grows. I was driving down and had plenty of time to think about uh, life and uh, everything that goes on. And something that uh, our brother right here from Greenville uh, said about the fact that we've had a lot of chaplains and actually we have another two uh, that's coming along. He's right in, he's in the Navy right now, and he feels the call of God to go to seminary and be a pastor, maybe a chaplain. And I thought, why is it that I have this love of the United States and apparently share it with others? And I thought, is it the beauties of this country? There is, to me, no more beautiful scenery than in my home state, Route 90, Interstate 90, in New York. That to me is heaven. It just looks so beautiful as I drive along. You can see the countryside and all the silos. We don't have a lot of that in California, so <laughs> it, it just is so beautiful. Pennsylvania is very nice too. But my one question is, when will they ever finish the Northeast Corridor? It, it has all, every year I say, certainly next year it will be finished. But it's not. And it wasn't today either. Uh, I get a, a little tear in my eye when I see Niagara Falls, when I see that, when I see New York City, my home area, parents, mother born there. First time I went back, saw that sign after 9-11, and coming from New Jersey just to see the panorama and see the missing buildings, a tear comes. It gets you right here. But is that what it really, really makes me love this country? No, no. It goes back, way back to 1961. We had a meeting in the sports arena where John F. Kennedy had been nominated the year before for president, same building. I remember the speakers, Fred Schwartz, ever heard that name? Fred Schwartz was in charge. It was called Christian Anti-Communist Crusade. And uh, I remember Pat Boone, Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, and one fellow that had my name. And he was, well, sorry. And he was uh, Ronald Reagan. I always wonder whatever happened to him, because he was a very good speaker. And uh, they were all there. And I remember Pat Boone making the comment that he 
would rather have his four little girls face a firing squad than to live in the United States under communism. That was a strong statement in those days. And Reagan said similar things. Reagan had, uh, since 1928, he, at his church, they had a man that came and spoke that had seen what life was like and come from the Soviet Union. And he, from that point on, he hated communism and what it would do to Christianity. And there to hear him speak, what a privilege. My parents would take me with them when they brought people like Dr. McIntyre and Dr. Malsbury to a television station. The only problem was it was at 11 o'clock at night. And uh, the program went from 11.30 till 1. I was 8 or 9 years old, and I would say, but I have school tomorrow. And my mother says, you'll get up, no problem. And uh, so she w see, I was at the end, so it wasn't that go to bed real early that you have when you're younger. Uh, and so I would stand there. And I remember standing there watching the man who did the news. His name was George Putnam. I was a little boy and watching him, and he would always say, here's to a better, a stronger America. That's America. I loved him. I loved, I was so honored to have been the one who hosted his 90th birthday. And I was thinking about it as I was sitting here, because I can see people that were here in the past. And he told me as we were sitting there, he said, Ron, he said, there's the ghosts of all my friends. They're gone. They're gone. This one, that one all the people I've known. And he said something else which was very sad to me. He said, you know, my grandchildren could care less that I've interviewed 11 presidents. They don't visit me. He said, you have more interest than my own family in me. He was a great American. It's people. People who love God and love their country made me have that love. And somehow those things, I guess, come out in the messages. But it's a country that was founded on the Word of God in so many ways. And I love that verse in the Old Testament that talks about God as our lawgiver, God as our judge. It's the three branches of government all there, judge, lawgiver, and king. There they are. We're going to look tonight at 1 Corinthians 15. The pastor spoke on this, the kerygma, the great verses 3 and 4 at the preparatory service on Friday night, and I thought this would be an appropriate passage to give the other end of this uh, great chapter, one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Uh, to be honest, in theology class, uh, during uh, in certain parts, especially Christology, when you had to give a proof text for everything, that you were establishing, if I couldn't remember what it was, I put 1 Corinthians 15, because certainly there's something there that would relate to it. And uh, I did well doing that. And it is certainly one of, you hate to talk about any passage being the greatest, but it is certainly up there as a passage of greatness. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll start at the 35th verse. And we're looking at the resurrection of the body. I've never been to an African-American funeral, but there was a young fellow who later became an evangelist who recounted his trip to one. He said the man's name was Clarence. And he said the minister first began by talking to the people just generally and uh, talking about the resurrection in beautiful terms. And then he went down and he spoke directly to the family and he gave them comfort from John 14. And then he went back and stood and it was an open casket and he shouted the man's name. His name was Clarence. And he shouted it and the young fellow that was sitting there, he was about 16, he thought, sure, Clarence would sit right up. And he talked to Clarence for 20 minutes, loudly, just looking right at the right at the body and telling him, Clarence, we didn't know you were going to leave us so soon and we had some things we needed to say to you. And he proceeded to talk about Clarence's life by talking directly to him. When he was done, he said, and now, Clarence, there's nothing more to say. That's it. And when there's nothing more to say, there's only one thing to say. 
good night. And when he said good night, he slammed the casket shut. And it reverberated. And the whole audience sort of held their breath as he slammed it shut. And then he said, it's good night, Clarence, because I know, I know God is going to give you a good morning. And then the choir started singing that great morning. <laughs> and everybody stands up. And this boy said, you know, that's what made me see that death for the believer doesn't have the sting. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 35. Let's start there. We're not going to hit every verse. Tonight we would be here several hours. Some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? In other words, how are we made new? Paul answers uh, quickly in verse 36, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. Then skip quickly down to verse 50. It says there, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Basically what Paul is saying there is that we have to die first to be raised into a new kind of living. God's always intended for us to have bodies. He gave us bodies in the beginning and he expects us to always have a body. But it will be a body that is not like our current body because the perishable or the corruptible cannot inherit incorruption or imperishability. President Kennedy made many mistakes in his first year in office. The worst was when he went to see Khrushchev and he was so sick, he was on 13 different medications that gave him a an exhaustion uh, where he would fall asleep and be confused. The Russian leader Khrushchev saw the weakness of the American president and the president's advisor said he's going to do something. He's going to do something. They were right. What did he do? He put missiles in Cuba. Fortunately, the president rose to the occasion after, of course, being in uh, his uh, Success was uh, limited and uh, pretty much a failure. But then there was that October 1962 when he did stand up. When the crisis was over, he told his wife, and this was in the tapes that have recently been released, he said to his wife, he said, you know, this would be a perfect time for me to be shot, just like Lincoln. And I'll be remembered for greatness. My legacy is here I've saved this country, I can be shot and be out. No problems. I'll be remembered for greatness. Unfortunately, 1 Corinthians 15 does not say that we look for a legacy. It says we look for a body. We are immortal right now. We will, we die but there is immediate new life. And it's the same person. We don't look for legacy. We look for the Lord. We look for a new body, a change that will occur. The great change will occur for believers at the instant that the trumpet blast announcing Christ's coming occurs. That's in 1 Corinthians 4, that familiar passage which gives the rapture of the church. We look forward to that day. What will we be like in heaven? Look back at verse 37 of chapter 15. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. It's a seed. What we sow when, we are, when our physical body dies is like a seed. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he did not appear.
appear that different. It was his resurrection body, but there was a recognition. How was it that Mary Magdalene recognized Jesus? You know, she thought he was the gardener. And how did she recognize him? The voice, right? She heard the voice. Others, it might have been some other characteristic. But Jesus came forth as the first fruits to show us the resurrection and what it actually means for us. And he was the first. Jesus was recognized as Jesus. Matthew 8.11, you don't have to turn there, but it alludes to the one day of meeting Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and we will recognize them. I don't know if there's going to be name plates in heaven, you know, with your century and uh, your name, what it might be. But we will recognize other believers. We'll be there with them in glory. What will we be like in heaven? We will be very similar to what we are now in some ways, except for certain areas that we'll talk about in verses 42 to 44. But you know, God has made us unique. We have personalities, we have gifts, gifts that are different. We have abilities, abilities that are different. These will not diminish in the presence of God. We'll see with our eyes, hear with our ears, speak with our mouths, walk with our feet in the glories of heaven. The seed of who we are today will correspond to who we are in heaven. But there are some differences. You know, some of us cry easily. I'm not one that cries easily. I have only, I was thinking as I drove into Philadelphia, there's some places here in this area that bring a tear to my eye. One is the 30th Street Station in Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania Station. You know what it is? That statue. That statue of the soul of the Pennsylvania Railroad worker who had gone to World War II and he's being lifted up by an angel. I just cry when I see that statue. I go to that station not to ride a train, just to look and stand there in front of that. It just really gets me. That that assurance, the history the assurance of salvation, the assurance of heaven shown in that statue. It's great. But we will be different. We will be different. The body is sown in corruption. Look at verse 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Back in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. All those verses together, let's begin with verse 42. It's sown in corruption. Our new bodies will be indestructible. Sometimes you have a food drive. What do you tell people not to bring? Perishable items, right? What food lasts the longest if you're going to bring a food item that's not in a can? Do you know? I actually found this out. It'll last for 75 years. Do you know what it is? Twinkies? That's right. Boy, Twinkies. He got that right away. <laughs> you are exactly right. And you know what? When we get to heaven, we will be more like a Twinkie than like a, <laughs> a banana or some other fruit. We will be like a Twinkie. I'm looking forward to I love Twinkies. <laughs> Amen. Get to that Twinkie. I look forward to it. 75 years. Kind of makes me wonder what's in the Twinkie. <laughs> you know, does it glow? <laughs> in heaven, 
our bodies will be indestructible. They're not going to wear out. We won't have migraines. We won't get tennis elbow. We won't have indigestion or cataracts or cancer. There's no pharmacies, hospitals, or funeral homes, and I've been to all of them more than once last week. There won't be those things. Amen. Heaven. Incorruption. The second thing, it says it will be glorious. You know, we are being transformed. This morning I spoke on prone to wander. You know, Robbie Robinson, who wrote that song, it was the last hymn that we sang, he wandered in his faith. And he wrote about it. And you know what? Even as he reached the end of his life, he did not have the assurance of his own salvation. Yet he wrote those words. Sealed it for the courts above. But he didn't feel it in his own life. He didn't understand 1 Corinthians 15. He didn't understand the gospel. We are forgiven. It's all God's work. It's not ours. Sovereignty. Predestination. Those were words not in Robbie Robinson's vocabulary. It is sown incorruptible. It's, I mean, it's raised incorruptible. It's also raised glorious. The glorious is the final stage of our transformation. We will be glorified. We will be fully like Christ. We won't be Christ, but we will have a resurrection body like Christ. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 is such a beautiful passage. Maybe some of you, it's a, a verse that you uh, have had as your favorite verse. Let's turn there for a moment. Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. Familiar passage. For our conversation or our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. I am always shocked when I don't see people for a while and then I see them and their body has suffered some deterioration. One time when I was a young minister, a lady said, I want you to go visit my uncle. He played for the Los Angeles Rams. It was a while ago. I was all excited. I'd never met a professional football player. So I ring the bell. He has a fancy home. I ring the bell, and I ring the bell, and I ring the bell. And it was a long trip, and I go, he's not there. Finally, the door slowly opens, and this man, about 50 years old, with a walker, comes to the door and says, come on in, and he slowly backs up. And I saw what it is when you're a professional football player, still relatively young. Uh, I was looking when I was at the airport and had about an hour to spare between planes and I always like to read for free some book that is out there and there was Dick Cheney's book so I went through the whole thing and I, I love the line where he said to Joe Biden he was in a wheelchair and he said Joe this is what you'll look like in four years <laughs> it's not good our bodies deteriorate but it will be a glorious body. We're being transformed. The vile body will be gone, will be made into a glorious body. The next verse has the thought that we will have a powerful body. What is weak today will be powerful in heaven. We won't become God or even anywhere as close, but we will have a new power, a new understanding. Nothing will be able to limit us from doing God's will. Don't you just want to do God's will? Isn't that your goal? I had a lady come this morning and she said after the service, she was, I would guess, in her 60s. She said, you know, I've wandered off the path. Can you pray for me? 
We're weak in the flesh. We wander sometimes. We get off the track. It won't be that way in heaven. We'll have power. We will do God's will every moment of every day. There'll be no question. There'll be no struggle with the flesh. We will do God's will. God's will right now is what we should be doing. We should be getting ready for that day. And even though we're weak, get up and go. Uh, I have started, I have finally broken into the 20th, late 20th century and am actually using the Internet, which I've always not wanted to do. I don't want to make purchases on the Internet. I don't like that. I'd still like to call up and talk to a live person. And when the bank says, just look up your account, I said, I don't want to, because I'm going to give you my sad story as to why I am overdrawn, and you will then take off the charge. And they do. I'm still trying at the bridge there. Now it's five dollars. Oh my. I thought of you know, George Washington, it was a dollar. He crossed the Delaware. It's up to five now. And uh, I, I told the guy, I said, last time, last time, I said, you know, I was at a missionary meeting. I've been serving the Lord all day. I think I'd, I've been crossing this bridge for over 50 years. How about a freebie? And the man says, if you can answer one question, and you probably know the answer, and I didn't at the time, but boy, I know it now. He said, what automobile were the, were the apostles driving in on the day of Pentecost? And I didn't know the answer. I know it now. It was an accord. They were all in one accord. But I didn't know the answer. And so he says, that'll be $4, and now it's 5 We'll be more powerful. We won't have tolls at the bridges. There will be no bridges. We'll be doing God's will, powerful in heaven. And it's going to be spiritual. Now, verses 45 to 49, and I started reading those. Let me read them again. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now the cults and others misunderstand, misconstrue what's being meant here, that, there, that heaven is just a spiritual existence and there is no true resurrection body for believers. That's not what's being said here at all. It's making a comparison that we were an earthy body. And in, that cannot follow into heaven because earthy is corrupt. It's, we are made, Adam is out of the ground, literally, in the Hebrew. It means out of the clay, out of the ground. The ground is clay. It will deteriorate. It can't follow that we can be that way in heaven. But we will have a body. It will be a spiritual body, but it will be a body like unto Christ's glorious body. And that's what Paul is making so plain but people do not understand. It's there. It's great. It's true. Paul does not see us as disembodied spirits or ghosts floating around the clouds. It's spiritual as opposed to natural. We'll be driven by the same Holy Spirit that empowered Christ in his resurrection body that spirit will be living in us in a way that is unabridged, just out there. You know, one thing that's difficult for many people right now is to witness for Christ. I look out at you, I wonder how many of you have shared a good news, the good news, 
with anyone this week. How many of you have talked about sports, talked about the weather, which is interesting? Uh, it's easy to do. I was at uh, one of these toll booths. We don't have toll booths in the West Coast. It's interesting. You, you put money in every now and again or you give it to somebody. And the man said, what do you think of this weather? And I said, it's, it seems like I, I, I'm starting to wonder if Mr. Camping was close. And he knew exactly what I meant. People know. People think that it seems like we're getting to the end of the world. You know, that can be a lead-in to the gospel. You don't always have to stay. Start with the weather, but turn it to Christ. We should be doing that right now. Will of God. Uh, it's not often that I, I was at a, stayed at a hotel and had breakfast right there in the hotel. There were all these people. I thought they were Korean, uh, but they were Chinese. And I went up to the head one, and I said uh, to him, I said, where are you from? He told me, I said, I have four seminaries in, uh, in your city. He said, you do? I said, yes, but they're underground. I said, you're not from the government, are you? And he said, no. I said, well, let me talk to you about it. He, I said, he says, are you, are you a Christian? Because we have a lot of Christians in China. And I said, yes. And I said, let's talk. And so we talked about 20 minutes. And then it became time for him to go. He was the, the group leader. But a young fellow, but he was eager to hear about the gospel. And I said, you know, he says, well, where in that, that Bible that you have? I said, you know, it's in every room in every hotel. You can read it. I said, start with John. He says, oh, I've heard of John. You know, we think, oh, no, this, we can't talk to this person. They're from a communist country. Oh, they will be, walk away from us. No. People want to hear the gospel. Give them the gospel. Don't walk away. Don't say, oh, I don't think this person wants to hear. You know, that's the will of God for you right now. You can live the will of God right now. Not perfectly. Not like you will in the powerful, resurrected body. The spiritual body that we will do the will of God all the time. But you know what? When we get there, we're not going to be able to witness. So you best do that right now. Because time is running out. We need to be witnessing now. You need to be bringing somebody to sit next to you in church. I've got, I call them my little preacher boys after, <laughs> and no, no uh, parallel with uh, the great uh, Bob Jones Sr., but I've got so many. I've got this little fella. I go to Los Angeles to pick him up. He lives near the county hospital. It's such a bad neighborhood that his birthday party, when I came out, my tires were slashed. And not too many showed up at his birthday. And I stayed longer than I'd planned. I knew it was unwise. He lives in a bad neighborhood. He wants to be a minister. His parents told me in Spanish, he's, they don't speak English, but they told me, the mother confessed to me that the father left two months before he was born and she was going to abort him but did not. But she didn't love him and she, like she should have. And she told me in Spanish, and I had someone from our church translate because she wanted to give a complete confession. She told me that this baby would tremble when she was holding it. And she told me that her mother told her that the baby knew she didn't love the baby. And she said sometimes he would disappear as he grew older. And she said one day they were looking for him and he was in a little storefront church. The only kid sitting there listening to the pastor in a little Spanish storefront church. All the other kids were running around and there was their little boy up there and they came and yelled at him, where were you? And they took him out. But she's confessing this now. She could see and she knows his desire. Last Sunday, we had the Bures, and I made it uh, rally day. A little late for rally day, but I made it rally day. He brought a friend. He brings his little sister and his older brother, who was getting tougher to bring. He's now 12. This boy's now 12. But he brought a friend with him to come to church. And he 
proudly told us that he led his little sister to accept Christ some months ago. He can witness already at 12. If he can witness at 12 to his friends, why can't we witness to others? We can. There's so much that we can do while we're still here. We have so much to look forward to. Why would you want to not share it with others? When you look at 1 Corinthians 15, do you really want to hide that to yourself? Don't you want to tell others? When you're sitting on a plane, you know, uh, my father was accused of over-witnessing. Dr. McIntyre always praised him. That was nice. A lot of the Senate criticized him, to be honest. They thought he was a little too evangelistic, maybe a borderline Baptist. Uh, you know what, they were right. I'll confess something. He was immersed <laughs> way later. But he, he stayed Bible Presbyterian. But the Reformed faith let him down. He went to a seminary here in New Jersey after going to Wheaton College, where Dr. Buswell was the president. Uh, he went to a seminary out here, New Brunswick Theological Seminary, where they told him that really it's better to be against any sort of war in Europe and we should protest, we should wage peace. And that's the message of the church. Wage peace. And he bought that. He bought that message. And he changed. His brother-in-law, my mother's brother who was a Presbyterian pastor, he said, you've had Wheaton, you had four years of this radical right-wing stuff. You can go to a liberal seminary and you get a little broader. He got broader. He went all the way over to their side. And he stayed on their side until one Saturday night when he was a pastor up here in Bushkill, Pennsylvania where I have a little brother buried in that little cemetery, that little church, Reformed Church of America, Dutch Reformed, what had been the Dutch Reformed Church. And one Saturday night, a fellow came on a motorcycle, and he stopped there because the, the parsonage was right next to the church. And he stopped there, and he knocked on the door, and it was late. And my father said, can I help you? And he said, yeah. He said, you know, I have, this, I have this real burden that, and I don't know how to get rid of it, and I just feel so dirty and so unclean, and I, I, want, I want to be free of it. My father said, well, here's what you need to do. You need to just start thinking good thoughts, following the golden rule, doing to others as, as you would have them do unto you. And all the things that he'd learned in seminary, all the nice little things, you know, Sermon on the Mount, but no, no cross. And then he read in the paper that week that, uh, and he recognized the motorcycle the fellow had crashed and died without Christ. And it struck him. And he said, I didn't give him the gospel. The gospel that I had learned, that I had received Christ when I was 13, and when I, and I went to Wheaton and heard it every, every message in chapel, and I forgot the gospel. And he swung all the way back. The denomination wasn't happy. They put him on trial later on in a, when he came to Buffalo. And he was put out of his church in a trial in the public courts as well as in the uh, classes of the Dutch Reformed Church. And all the ministers stood against him. Even one of his cousins stood against him and put him out. And they testified, and it was, a, it was a Roman Catholic judge who believed that the hierarchy should make the final call. And he was put out of the church. Dr. McIntyre saw the article, because it went all over, all over the newspapers, ousted pastor. And he saw that, he went out and visited him in Buffalo, and that's why we're Bible Presbyterians. And of course, Dr. Buswell, too was uh, right there also uh, encouraging him to join. But McIntyre went out to see him. And because it was the same thing that he'd experienced, a little different, a little more uh, intense, but the same thing. 
You stand for the faith. You witness for Christ. Then you read a passage like 1 Corinthians 15, and you see why do we believe in the fundamentals of the faith. It's because it relates to not only our future, but the future of our family, friends, and all who we meet. C.S. Lewis said, there is no mortal man. Now that sounds like heresy. But it's the truth, because once you're born, you're going to keep going, either up there or in the fires of hell, where Jesus said, the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If that doesn't scare you into seeing that you need to right now be testifying for your faith, not just rejoicing in these great truths, oh yes, we have a new body waiting for us. But that you want to share that. Because there will be that day when the trumpet call is given. We will receive that new body. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. So beautiful. As we close, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. That's us. Those that have died. And then it says, we shall be changed. In other words, we need that new body, those that are yet alive and remain. Ah, you look forward to that? It's good to look forward, but you know, you don't need to go right now. Uh, one comedian said, uh, it, I don't fear death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Maybe we all have that feeling sometimes, you know? I've seen death. I must say, I, I missed one elder, uh, his family said that he was 90 some years old, his family said that he looked up, and smiled, and he saw Jesus, and it was wonderful. I've been where it wasn't very pleasant. My own father-in-law, just before my birthday. And we were there for a big celebration, and, and mainly my wife's birthday. And he fell from the table to the floor. I said, call 911, and I tried to bring him back. I remember that forever. It wasn't pleasant. Death is not always pleasant. You try. You try to keep them with you. But they go. Sometimes they go. It just reminds you, you need to serve while you're here. Because that day does come. I can't guarantee it will be a glorious, like George Washington's ascension to heaven in the Capitol Dome. I love that. It's beautiful. It's a little Greek. But it's still beautiful. Uh, that's not always the way it looks. But it will be glorious when you get to the other side. There. The incorruptible. The imperishable. The powerful. The spiritual. The glorious. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, just a glimpse of uh, verses that uh, we really didn't do honor to. There's so much. But Lord, it's a challenge as we thrill thinking about the results of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. It's not just a nice story, uh, the kerygma, the gospel. It's, it's the resurrection of the body. It's the goal. It's where we're going. It's God's goal. It's our goal. It's the will of God. It should be our will to follow His will right now and prepare like we're already there and to share that message of the resurrection of the body with others who may walk away, who may make fun, 
and who may listen and ask questions and come to faith in Christ. May that be our goal as we read this great chapter. In Christ's name, amen.